Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and the Chief Medical Officer, Executive Vice President of the CLL Society here at ASH 2023. Hi, I'm Dr. Adrian Wiesner. I'm a hematologist working at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Wiesner, you and I have seen the whole treatment landscape of CLL change with the introduction a PCI 32765 or ibrutinib, which I think in February will be 10 years that it's been commercially available, but you had it in some of the very, very earliest trials. And today, or yesterday at ASH, you presented an oral presentation on sort of a 10-year experience with ibrutinib. Can you share what you think some of those highlights are and what we've learned from that on patients who've been on this medicine or started it, you know, a decade ago now? Yes, very happy to do so. It's, it's been fascinating to see this early time with ibrutinib. Uh, that was a time, if you think back now, more than 10 years, right? So that chemotherapy was virtually the approach everybody got. And we knew that it's not good for patients with deletion 17P. We knew it's hard for patients older than 65 to actually tolerate this. So we were fortunate to be able to open up a trial with ibrutinib for exactly those patients, the lesion 17P or older than 65. And what was amazing is that how interested patients really were to come and traveled from California, from Texas, from Canada to participate in, in this trial. So, and some of the most rewarding aspects were to see how quickly when patients started the ibrutinib, things got better. So lymph nodes shrank, they felt better, they were... Yes, there were some side effects, and many of those side effects actually were time-limited, and in part because maybe there were not many other choices, in part because the patients were really motivated to stay on, on this ibrutinib, and our overall discontinuation rate for the drug is relatively lower than we see in some other trials. And I think that was really because patients knew that they were getting something that was exceptional and was a great help in difficult situations, especially, of course, also for we also enrolled patients with relapse disease, right, where the limits, where the available options were even fewer. And so what um, we then, after this really initial excitement of seeing, oh, it's working, it's working very well, um, is the long-term outcome that we see. So that now with actually more than 10 years of follow-up, the data cut we had is a little bit before 10 years of follow-up, um, we see that 50% of patients are alive and progression-free at seven, seven plus years. And again, this is for a high-risk group of patients mostly, so I think that's an exceptional Over result. Over 65 or 17P deleted, yeah. Yeah. And with 10 years, we also have uh, the overall survival um, is 75% for patients with relatively better risk groups um, within the, the whole study. So what is really remarkable is this duration of response. What's also remarkable is that when patients had to switch, the ibrutinib was a bridge into a new era to some mm -hmm. degree, right? When most patients who then eventually started progressing on ibrutinib now had options because venetoclax became available. And so we also had options to then treat patients, successfully treat patients who, can, who relapsed on the ibrutinib. What we still do see that about a third of patients discontinued the study. Again, this is over a very long period of time, but because of side effects. And I'm not, sometimes I'm not really not sure if we, uh, how much we can say is 
due, a side effect due to being on the drug? Or keep in mind when you're, the patient's over 65, the median age was 69. So you go from 70 to 80 in that period, right? Right. So some things also happen along the way, whether you have CLL or you are treated with ibrutinib. Yeah, I remember a patient saying, you know, I've never had CLL before, but I've never been this age before. And sometimes <laughs> it's hard to sort exactly. out. Is this yes. just what happens when you're 75 years old? Or is it a side effect of the disease or of the medication I'm taking? Right. So we do know, unfortunately, that some side effects are probably related to the ibrutinib, especially we do see hypertension, so our elevated blood pressure. I think there's much more sensitivity to that now, and when you appropriately manage that, you can get that also into a better clinical range with, mm -hmm. yes, additional medications. We also, unfortunately, have uh, seen more concerning cardiac side effects, and those patients have discontinued. We have had many patients who actually... So let me stop you on that. When you say concerning fine, you talk about atrial fibrillation, are you also talking about ventricular and sudden death? Tell us about that. So we've seen all of what you mentioned. So we, more common, we see atrial fibrillation. So this is an irregular mechanism of triggering the heart rate. So it's a, it's a variable heart rate that can be without symptoms or it can be with uncomfortable symptoms and with a risk of developing a stroke. So we had some patients who, actually virtually everybody with this newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation continued on ibrutinib. Where appropriate, we used blood thinners as recommended by guidelines and by cardiologists. We also had um, one patient who unexpectedly passed away that we refer this to a sudden death or sometimes also called, called sudden cardiac death. We typically assume that this is an irregular heart rhythm that leads the heart to stop eventually. Or, you know. So yes, we had one patient on this trial who experienced that. And other reasons for discontinuations were second malignancies. Again, we're getting a little bit also into the age range where that can be diagnosed no matter how healthy the person was before. So I don't think it's clear that there would be an increased risk for second malignancies, but when that happens, then patients may other, need other treatments and that's a reason to discontinue. We had three patients who discontinued for memory issues maybe early dementia, which then also makes traveling to NIH more challenging. And all these patients were in their approaching 80 or in their early 80s, so not out of context. Right, that's the age that we expect to see yeah. some dementia. Yes. Yeah. So, and then one amazing finding really was that we, we from the get-go measured the level of disease that's left. We refer to that as minimal residual disease. I, I call it measurable residual disease. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> measurable disease. So we measured how much disease there is. And we can measure up to when one cell in 10,000 white cells is still a CLL cell. Once we go below that, the assay may still pick up a few cells where we kind of set the threshold at one in 10,000. If it goes below that, we now call it undetectable, right? And that's, that's commonly used in CLL trials. So we built this in from the beginning, and the first few years it was, well, we see, you know, one, five out of 100 cells are still CLL cells. And then we get slowly, around five years, maybe we get to one in 100 cells of CLL cells. But more and more, we actually got patients to have either really no detectable CLL cells with, it's always a question of the assay you're using, but with the best sensitivity, we didn't see any more CLL cells. Which was not what the thinking was. The thought was you didn't get to this undetectable measurable disease, UMRD, 
with the BTK inhibitors like ibrutinib. Correct. That, that's been kind of what the field accepted, right? BTK inhibitors you give forever. The CLL doesn't really go completely away. Whereas when etoclax you give for a short period, of relatively yeah. shorter period of time, and you often achieve this undetectable status. So yes, that was somewhat unexpected. And for the whole trial, it was 15 patients, 15% uh, of the patients, so 13 patients got to that level. And only one of them actually has relapsed so far. We have some where we see that and they're on, still on the medication, or did they? Not all of them are still on the medication. No, we actually have notably one patient who discontinued more than three years ago. It was his first ever treatment, uh, the ibrutinib. He discontinued for a side effect uh, three years ago, over three years ago, and we had three serial measurements where he's still undetectable. Wonderful. So it looks like this can really be sustained for long periods of time, even off drug. Uh, intriguing question is why this happens. Is it just if you are on it long enough, eventually the drug is able to get the last cell or at least get it to a level where we can't see it anymore? Or is it that maybe the whole, what we refer to as environment changes so this means the other cells in lymph nodes and bone marrow, maybe they are also somewhat changed in that they don't support the CLL cells anymore. Because we know in, in CLL, other cells are helping CLL cells uh, stay alive. And, right, and they grow. hijack the immune system and the immune system becomes supportive of them. They have these nurse-like cells and other exactly, things that help yes, keep them alive. That's nurse-like cells, so the environment nurtures in some ways the, the CLL cells. But we also know that you can recruit the immune system to eradicate CLL cells, right? So one approach was stem cell transplant, uh, mm -hmm. uh, really the, which is basically an immune transplant. Another approach is the CAR T cells. So we know that immune cells can kill CLL cells. So an intriguing question is whether with this long-term therapy and with an overall improvement in, in some immune function, we actually would get the, the patient's own immune system to really recognize the, the CLL cells and be able to kill them off. So that, especially for patients where we stop the drug and it doesn't come back, you wonder if there's now an immune control or maybe it's because there's really so few cells that for years they're not detectable. Yeah. But that's an intriguing question and that's something we want to look into. So we're now actually, um, after this more than 10 years, we're almost more interested in the T cells <laughs> right now <laughs> to see whether the patient's T cell carry a, a marker or a memory of that would indicate they know what the CLL cell looks like and actually attacks those cells. Because CLL is a cancer of the B cells and that's what the ibrutinib works on, but it has yeah. some effect on the T cells, which are the cellular part of the immune system and help control not just CLL, but other cancers and other things too. Right, and we have seen in other studies we conducted that the CLL cells have a program that lets them inactivate T cells. That is part of the big problem in CLL, that the CLL cells actually inactivate some, some normal immune mechanisms. One reason to get more infection, one reason to not respond as well to vaccines, and maybe also one reason for the increased risk of developing melanoma. Right, and other skin second cancer, cancers, right? Yeah. Or potentially other second cancers. So the CLL cells have a program, a trick to inactivate a competent immune system. This is amazing. What a, a plethora of information from just, you know, this one sort of game-changing trial of just, you know, not that, I mean, a lot of patients, but not that many patients. Any thoughts or any final kinds of sense of where you want to go with this or what 
take away the risk for a patient from this. So, first of all, I would really like to thank the patients who've been on this trial and actually kept some of them. We have taken so many trips to come to NIH to stay on that tri trial for such a long time. And we tend to draw quite a bit of blood. For the first five years, we did the bone marrow every year. We've done lymph node biopsies. So I think we really have been able to learn a lot thanks to incredible participation of the patients in, in being part of the team in, in investigating, right? So with that, we learned a lot, and we um, sometimes see now see that patients were maybe because some new cardiac finding, we say you better stop the ibrutinib at this point because you have also other options if and when you need it. Also because we've seen that when patients stop, often the response lasts for years, even if they are not undetectable for residual disease. So if there's still some CLL left, but it doesn't immediately grow back. And then it is, patients are very reluctant in that setting to then drop what has worked so well for them for eight, nine, 10 years. It's, so, but now going into treatment, um, if you had to make your decision about first-line treatment today, I think you would really want to consider something that's time-limited. Overall, that may also be safer because there's no, there's no free ride in the end. Every right. drug comes with some downside, even if it's just that you have to take it every day. Um, so these time-limited approaches, either with venetoclax or with some BTK inhibitor type approaches, um, offer for many patients, I think, a short, relatively short period of time with often really long periods without any treatment. So I think that's, that's great. What some of the specialists in CLL, and I would count me to those who would argue that for deletion 17P patients, I would still go with the continuous treatment with a BTK inhibitor, with ibrutinib, bacalabrutinib, sanabrutinib. I, I do think in that setting, just keeping, keeping things down is better than letting it, let it grow back, right? Because when we do time-limited therapy so far, we have no sense that we would cure a substantial por proportion of patients. Virtually everybody responds. Virtually everybody has a time of treatment that goes well. But it looks like early indications are that for most patients, eventually it will grow back. And in the, the setting of having deletion 17P, I think it's better not to let it grow back. It, it's amazing your kind of thoughtfulness and all the information you get from this just one uh, trial. And I join you in the gratitude for the patients who you took a risk. We didn't know how well ibrutinib would work at that time and 10 years later are still coming. Um, I'm so grateful for the research you and your colleagues are doing at the National Institutes of Health. And this, is, this has changed everything. I mean, ibrutinib changed everything. And, and I'm so grateful for the role that you played and those patients played yes. in jumping in early. Thank you so much. Thank you.